Socialism organizes politics around money, and socialism organizes politics around people. Um, and yeah, so, you know, but, but if you look at ex um, 20th century examples of socialist economies, like the Soviet Union, they weren't any better than us, right? I mean, but that's because they didn't recognize, they imported the same anthropocentric, you know, and economistic uh, axiological orientation that we have, right? And they just claimed, to, and they weren't even really socialist either, right? They were just, what were they? I don't know. Totalitarian, like yeah. Uh -huh. totalitarians. And they just completely demolished their environment while they were in power because they didn't view ecological holes as having any moral status at all, just like us, right? So, but real, so, you know, eco socialism would, would be some kind of a blend of, of, uh, of kind of the eco, you know, eco socialism and eco libertarianism. That's really what Stone gives us. Stone's kind of an eco libertarian. He just wants to expand the franchise of legal standing to ecological holes, and in doing that, of course, completely reshape our economic system. Because once you start having to pay for the damage, once as a business person, you start having to pay for the damage that you do to the, to the, to the ecological hole, then obviously your business model is gonna have to change dramatically, right? You're gonna have to include all of those external, those costs that you used to be able to externalize, right? You now have to include them on the balance sheet of your company. You know, because either way, you know, ultimately you're going to be made to pay, right, when the guardian of the ecological whole takes you to court. The court will force you to pay anyway. So you'll have to change your whole business model, right? Which would be really cool. But that's not socialism. Socialism would be an example. That's more, socialism would be more like what we have now, only, only with greater protections, you know, more wildlife refuges and much, more strong, much stronger government regulations on what companies can do. Um, but some mixture of the two, right, would probably serve us uh, way better than the current system serves us. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, let me get this attendance sheet going around in the last five minutes. I always seem to forget my administrative duties. Uh, um, but, you know, I could ask you guys, are you comfortable if you are asked to, to describe the difference between Holmes Ralston's moral judgment of the extinction of passenger pigeons from Baird Collicutt's moral judgment and of course their justifications of their moral, how do they explain the claim that extinction of passenger pigeons was morally wrong? They explain that claim in different ways, right? Maybe subtly different, but significantly different philosophically. And that's the sort of difference that I'm hoping my students can begin to describe, can begin to recognize. Um, yes? Did you have your hand up? No, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. You were just changing your hair. All right. Um, sometimes I, I think I see a hand go up and, and I get hopeful that it's going to be a really good question. But, um, <clears throat> so what else haven't we been through yet? Well, so it could be that Holmes Rolston is wading into some difficulty by his insistence that there are value facts in the world. Okay? Which is an insistence of the deontological ecocentrist. Okay? Um, so, are there? Are there value facts? Should, should a reasonable evolutionary historian conclude, after getting a PhD in evolutionary history, right? Let's say you go on and get a PhD in evolutionary, and you know as much as there is, almost as much as there is to know about the evolution of life on planet Earth. Can you reasonably identify any kind of value fact in evolutionary phenomena? Right? Darwin says no, doesn't he? I'm pretty sure of that. Other people disagree, other people accept, other, other, evolutionary, uh, other evolutionary historians accept um, Darwin but disagree with him on whether or not the adaptations, right, as, as organisms evolve, do they, is their evolution just a random you know, just the result of random interactions with the environment, or is there something teleological about 
the evolution of an organism. Rolston says that there is, and that's where he gets all of his normative claims, right? From the recognition, what he believes to be the case, namely that evolution is teleological. All right? So maybe he's committing the naturalistic fallacy, which you'll recall is any attempt to predicate a normative argument on an empirical claim. Right? Rolston wants to say there are these value facts empirically in the world right, that are evident if you understand evolution. Take a long-term view, then you can understand that these value facts are being defended over... Right? An, an organism runs a talic course through its environment. It's headed somewhere, right? And from the fact that it's headed somewhere, from it having a telos, we are obligated to give it normative status, uh, to give it moral status, right? To recognize it as having moral status, okay? So he may be committing a naturalistic fallacy by insisting that some facts in nature are value facts, right? And then these are examples of different facts in nature that any ecologist or biologist would recognize. And Rolston goes on to say that these facts indicate that a species runs a tailored course through its environment through time, defending a particular form of life. And at an ecosystemic level, an ecosystem generates a spontaneous order that envelops and produces the integrity, stability, and beauty of its, of its biotic communities. Ecosystems, too, according to Rolston, are selective systems. All right? Um, but you might accuse him of reading something into evolution that isn't actually there. Okay? Um, and again, you know, attributing... Um, attributing moral status to things that don't really have moral status. And, and that, right, how do, you, how do you conclude based on the facts of an ecological whole that that ecological whole has moral status, right? How do you do that? And maybe in the end, it doesn't have moral status except insofar as it benefits human beings. And then we're back, though, then we're back to Norton, aren't we? We can't get away from Norton and Wilson and these guys. We can probably get away from Wilson fairly easily. But Norton has got us in our grip. Anyway, all right. Um, we're out of time. We have about one minute left, so I'll just call it good. If you didn't sign the attendance sheet, make sure you sign it. Did it make its way all the way around? Okay, it's making its way around right now. All right, have a good weekend, everybody. And so we really are changing gears now, okay? And I think you'll find the Thomas Birch essay very refreshing and very, very different than everything we've done so far. So next week, we'll have a lot of fun with Thomas Birch.